Susan Greer, who is our next speaker, was called to the bar in 1973. She has, since her call, been associated in practice with McCarthy & McCarthy in Toronto, in which firm she is a partner and in whose estates, trusts, and estate planning department she practices. Those of you who know Susan most likely know her for her activities with the Canadian Bar Association. She has, since 1973, been a member of the Wills and Trusts subsection and a member of Ontario Council. And she has been secretary of the Ontario branch and for five years, from 1975, a member of the executive of the National Young Lawyers section. Susan has, since her call, been an instructor in the estate administration section of the bar admission course and a tutor in the wills drafting seminar at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Susan Greer. Thank you very much, Marvin. <laughs> well, I have been given the, the topic of recent developments in probate practice. And um, I felt that certainly from a practical point of view, I would like to cover things that I have found in the past seven years are sometimes difficult things to locate in textbooks. And they're, they're often things that are not talked about in cases at all. But for, for the general practitioner and for the practitioner um, who, who likes to have uh, pr practical answers to problems, um, I am covering four topics. In the, when the paper is published, there will be attached as appendices certain precedents, which I am not saying are by any means letter perfect. I'm just saying they might be of some assistance to you um, if you come across the problem. I have always been one, of course, who's relied on Rodney's book and relied on Morris Cullody's lectures from law school. And I have also um, uh, relied on Hardy Rideout's uh, very good patience and very good sense of humor in the surrogate court. And uh, one of the things that has seemed to uh, cropped up recently is the question of due execution of wills. Now, that might seem to be an old hat topic, and you might say, well, why are we talking about due execution of wills? But in my view, and certainly in, in, in recent practice, we have come across these problems because um, we are finding that people are buying the old stationer's forms. And uh, some of those old stationer's forms um, are, are really negligent in, in the setup of the will. And so we, we find that testators, for example, are, are signing these will forms. They're writing their own wills, which is even worse in some cases. Um, I think that there are some solicitors making the mistake of sending wills out uh, for clients to sign without proper instructions. And you know, there is, there is a question that the solicitor really ought to be in attendance uh, when the will is signed by the client. So the question of due execution, in my view, is one that we ought to um, examine. Um, Section 4 of the Succession Law Reform Act, of course, covers due execution. But, and, um, the difficulty comes when the execution of the will does not fall within the section. There is um, a legal maxim, and I'm always very bad at pronouncing uh, Latin words, but it is omniae presumenter rita essa acta, which simply means that it is assumed that the requirements of the statute, uh, with the reference to the formalities of execution, have been complied with. And the maxim in, uh, in several cases has been stated to be an expression in short form of a reasonable probability and of the propriety in point of law acting on such a probability that the will was executed. Now that maxim was affirmed in the Harris v. Knight case, which is, is sort of one of the beginnings and in earlier English cases. And um, Tybalt in his book sets out the common law proposition that if a will purports to be properly executed and attested, and there is no doubt that it is the testator's will, the court will assume that it was properly executed and attested, although the evidence of the attesting witness as to the execution may not be satisfactory. Now, I think that is a very important point to remember, because often um, you find that the witnesses cannot be traced. And if the, if the will is simply submitted by the executor, to the court for proof in common form, 
then the court does not inquire into whether it was properly executed or um, anything about the witnesses. If the testator's signature is proved and if the executor swears, uh, then the grant is issued. Where, where we run across the problems, of course, is where a caveat is filed or where an intervention is filed, uh, contesting the validity of the execution of the will. And, you know, a will can be signed Napoleon as long as the person signing it, um, it's in his handwriting. He might call himself Napoleon. A will can be signed mother. A will can be signed X. So those aren't the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, the courts have always looked to the testator's intention, I think, when examining the will to see if it has been properly um, executed. And the cases involving the, the will form that has been contested have set down a number of legal principles. But in my view, each case seems to turn on the facts. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Sheard used to always say, well, on the one hand, the court must look and carefully examine each word of the will. But on the other hand, the court says, we must take a look at the intention of the testator, the surrounding circumstances, and so forth. So in, in many instances, you know, it, it really is roulette when you are presenting um, some of the, the fact situations before the court. So in, um, in certain of the cases, um, the, the principle, the, the legal Latin maxim uh, was followed and the courts point this out. And in the case of Re Gardner, where all of the parties conceded that the signatures of the witnesses and of the testator were correct, and even when the witnesses did not ever remember signing the document, the court accepted that the will was validly executed. And of course, this is also the case if the witnesses are dead or forgetful because of age or infirmity. Now, Section 7 of the, the Act sets out the principles for due execution, and I'm not going to go over those with you. But there have been a number of interesting developments uh, in recent years regarding the will form. Um, we, have, we have, on the one hand, two conflicting cases. One is called Rebean, and one is called Reman. And um, Rebean held that where the testator neglected to sign the will in the appropriate place on a will form, but signed his name on the envelope. You know, some of those old will forms had envelopes. Signed the name on the envelope, that it was not intended to be his signature and the will was held invalid. On the other hand, you had the man case that said where the signature was on the envelope in which the will was placed, the will had been duly executed. Now, there's a 1979 case called Re Riva, and I think it's an important case because um, it, it went against the Bean decision, um, which, which was, uh, uh, Rodney Hull, by the way, was trying to uphold. And I thought that the case was useful because it involved one of the printed will forms where there's a tiny asterisk out in the right-hand margin. There is no place for the testator to sign. All of the clauses are shifted way over to the right of the page so that when the, when the testator, if the testator has glasses on, looks the tiny asterisk and at the bottom it says testator signs here, but there is no place for the signature. So in the Riva case, the testatrix signed her name in the blank on the front. This is the last will. She uh, signed her name in the attestation clause. She signed her name on the back of the will form, which was a folded form and she signed her name on the envelope, but she did not sign her name where the asterisk was. And on top of that, the witnesses could not be traced. Um, great efforts were made to trace the witnesses, and it was alleged um, by Rodney that perhaps the testatrix herself had signed the names of the two witnesses. Um, the, the, the signatures were, <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't, I should, shouldn't say that with Rodney not here, but the signatures were such that um, there, there could have been a question. There, there certainly could have been a question um, as to the signing. Um, a handwriting expert, Mr. Packard, Royston Packard was brought in to examine the handwriting of the deceased, examined other documents with their handwriting, examined the handwriting 
Um, the court allowed the will to be precipitated up to Barry, where, where he lives. And his opinion was that it was the three signatures were done by three different persons and with three different pens. And he provided an opinion to that effect, which was submitted to the court. And he was also um, an expert witness um, on that. And uh, the uh, judge um, made, I think, a, a, a very, uh, very solid case uh, against these will forms and upheld that the will was validly executed. The judge followed a case in the beginning called In the Goods of Francis Peverett. And I think it's important that we, we look at these principles. Two things may be laid down as general principles. The first is that the court is always extremely anxious to give effect to the wishes of persons if satisfied that they are really their testamentary wishes. And secondly, the court will not allow a matter of form to stand in the way if the essential elements of execution have been fulfilled. And therefore, um, the, the judge, I think, hung his hat partly on that case. And then he, he went back and he examined um, other, other cases which dealt with the section regarding due execution of the will. And, and he took up a quote which said, the clear intention of section 9, which is now incorporated into the new act, is that within the limits of reasonable construction, the court is to go to all lengths to save a genuine act of execution from being defeated by the formal requirement. Now, I think that is important because, um, in, in my view then, the courts are getting away from cases like the Ree Bean case that um, was uh, on a very fine point. The will was uh, held not validly executed. Um, he also mentioned the estate of C.R. Phibbs, a case where the witnesses could not be located, and he upheld the will on the following grounds. There was insufficient space to sign where the asterisk was. There were letters of the deceased in her handwriting, which, um, which uh, upheld the very same areas of concern as did her will. In other words, she, she'd written out a, almost like a holograph will, but it was before holographs were legal. And the three main areas of concern were legitimate. They were charities that she had an interest in, her brother and her niece. And because of the asterisk, it seemed necessary for her to write her name on the back of the will form. It said, this is the last will and testament of me. And she went to the trouble of getting the form, filling it in, getting two witnesses. And in his view, the signature on the back of the folded will form fell within the requirements of uh, the Wills Act. Now, then there has been a, um, a recent decision uh, reported in the Estates and Trusts Report called Re Phillip, and some of you may be aware of it. It's a 1980 case, Manitoba Court of Appeal. And in this case, we again had another will form. And here, in, in my view, the courts were, were doing cartwheels to uphold the, the testatrix's intentions. Um, and I, I must say, for the gentleman uh, in the room today, it, it's, it's rather interesting that most of these will form cases are women who are filling in the forms. I noticed this as I followed it through. Um, the Philip case accepted as a holograph will, a will form, where the testatrix had filled in the blanks. Now, again, she had failed to sign the will. And the court felt that she had intended using the words in the printed form only as a guide in making a holograph will. And the trial judge held that the deceased had signed the will with testamentary intention and meant it to be her will. No witnesses signed the will. And one of the questions which, which the, uh, sorry, she signed it, but there were no witnesses. One of the questions which the appellate court was asked to consider um, was whether the printed portion of the will form was essential or non-essential, was formal or superfluous. And the appellate court split on the decision, and I thought the dissent was interesting because you, you, you could see sort of the, the two lines of jurisprudence here. The one which sticks to form and the one which looks at the broad intention. And the dissent said, one has to strain plain and simple language to conclude that this document is wholly in the handwriting of the deceased. 
In order to do so, one must also ignore all the printed material, some before the handwriting, some in the middle of the handwriting, and some at the bottom of the document before the signature. One cannot cast his legal eyes only on those portions which had been written in longhand. It is not the court's duty to strain the plain meaning of words. Now, that was the dissent. Um, so he placed a strict interpretation. But the court, in the majority view, tried to give effect to the testator's obvious intention, which was to provide specific legacies to charities and others, and the residue to be divided between a niece and a nephew. And the majority of the appellate court accepted counsel's submission um, that the cases of Reed Laver and Sunrise Gospel Hour v. Twist should be applied. And they ignored the portions um, of the printed will form. So I came to the conclusion then that the courts seem to be uh, interpreting the law to give effect to a testator's obvious intentions. Um, and I, I think that this is, is an important move in, in probate practice. Now, a second topic that I wanted to cover was the topic of what to do when the testator disappears. And I think this is probably becoming <laughs> an increasingly uh, complex problem for those people who are left to tidy up the affairs of the testator. Now, maybe the testator has disappeared to Switzerland, where the, the bank account is or to Mexico, where the, the money uh, which he has embezzled is now in place. But I think those are not, not the usual cases that, that we have to deal with. We have to deal with the cases where um, there has, has been a probable accident, a drowning, for example, um, a, a small plane going down and no one locating the, the plane, um, someone just simply disappearing, the old riverbank cases or whatever. And this, I think, puts the next of kin and, and the spouses in a very difficult position. Um, there are really three routes that can be taken in administering um, the absentee's assets, if we want to call them the absentee. The legislature has provided a statutory method under the Absentees Act, which does not exactly spring to mind when one's thinking of, of legislation, but it is there in fact. And basically, that allows the absentee's assets to be administered uh, much like a committee ship under the Mental Incompetency Act. It is a committee ship. And if you read the sections of the Act, um, you will see that the, the method of administering these things is very similar, that the same type of application, the duty to account, um, and so forth. And if the absentee falls within the meaning of the section in the Act, then the court can declare that person to be an absentee. Now, one of the difficulties I see with that, of course, is that there is no certainty. Does one wait seven years and then make a court application uh, to, uh, regarding presumption of death? Um, in, in my paper, I've referred to a number of cases, but I am looking at the time element, and so I think that I'll just simply say that that is one of the methods, and it could be considered. And the second method, of course, is the surrogate court's method. And I think that, that this method is, um, is a, a tidier method, I suppose, for winding things up, but uh, can also pro provide some difficulties. The Surrogate Courts Act, um, Act uh, under Section 21, says, subject to the Judicature Act, all, or the, ju ju yeah, judic, judic, never mind, subject to the <laughs> Judicature Act, all jurisdiction and authority in relation to matters and causes testamentary lies, of course, with the Surrogate Court. The Surrogate Court alone has jurisdiction to make an order permitting an applicant to swear that the person died on or since the date of the disappearance. Now, MacDonnell, Sheard, and Hull point out that there is no jurisdiction in the Supreme Court, apart from statute, to make a declaratory order presuming someone dead. And the presumption is that the, is that the person is dead, not really that he died at any particular time or died with or without issue or anything else. Um, there are a number of cases, old cases that deal uh, with the question of remarriage, where people made applications to court because they wanted to remarry and someone had disappeared. 
I don't think I need go into those particularly, but I want to refer you to uh, a very well written article in the Estates and Trusts Quarterly by J.C. Shepherd, who canvasses the areas of the law regarding presumption of death. And that's in the um, 1979 4 Estates and Trusts Quarterly. Um, Shepherd states that the primary jurisdiction for declaring death arises in the surrogate court, for the surrogate court must find on an application for letters of administration or probate that the person is in fact dead. And um, there was um, um, a footnote uh, to that statement comes to the conclusion um, that the statement in a case called Reed Lloyd. Now, I hate to refer you to this because in the paper there are three different cases of Reed Lloyd referred to, but it does say that only the surrogate um, court has jurisdiction. That he, he feels that, that, that the fact that only the surrogate court has jurisdiction is probably wrong in light of the later cases. I tend to disagree with Mr. Shepard's conclusions on that point, and I have set out my, my reasons in, in the paper. Um, I would suggest that the application under the surrogate court is important because the applicant makes the application so that the applicant can swear an affidavit that the person is dead. In other words, the court is not really deciding that. The court only decides that it, on the evidence submitted, it will allow the applicant to swear the, that affidavit or to make, and therefore, when the the application is accepted and the order made, then the executor or uh, the applicant for letters of administration may go ahead and apply to the court for probate or letters of administration so that the estate can be wound up. Um, the, the, what the court is doing after it allows the applicant to swear the declaration is simply accepts then the will for proof in common form. And then if anyone wants to contest this, uh, then of course they have the right to do so. Now the difficulty of course arises when the absentee reappears because he could find his estate administered and all the assets have disappeared. And Shepard does point this out in his article. And, um, and in his view, and, and certainly in my view, the, the, the law is not clear. I, I think that the trustee is likely protected by the sections of the Trustee Act. But um, on the other hand, it, it also allows the absentee to try and trace assets. So, so again, we have a difficult position. Um, the third alternative is the procedure under the Insurance Act. And the question of presumption of death often arises in these so-called mysterious disappearance cases where insurance policies are involved. Uh, someone calls you and, and, and says, I'm the beneficiary of this insurance, or usually the, the insurance company calls and says, what do we do under these circumstances? Um, Section 183 of the Act, Insurance Act, gives the Supreme Court on application to it the power to infer death of the insured from the evidence presented to it. Section 184 extends this to cover the situation where the person has been absent for seven years or more. Now, it's of great comfort to the insurance companies if they say to the um, applicant, well, let's wait seven years, see if he turns up. And uh, it, it can become um, of, of great hardship to the beneficiary of that insurance policy. And um, there, there is no uh, easy answer, I suppose, unless you see, you go by way of the route of the surrogate court provisions, or someone takes out letters of administration or probate, which the, then the named beneficiary of the policy can present to the insurance company. Now, presumably, there's no death certificate, so uh, however, the insurance company might accept that, and you might get around it in that way. Now, one, um, the cases point out that one of the difficulties with the Insurance Act application is that any declaration made by the court applies only to that particular policy for which the, the declaration is made. So um, it might be appropriate then to give notice to all insurance companies at the same time um, so that you can deal with it all in one application. And um, it should also be remembered that the, the federal government, in its wisdom, 
um, has put provisions in other acts which would assist a spouse. For example, federal government statutes such as the Public Service Superannuation Act gives the minister the discretion to issue a certificate deeming a contributor to be dead, as does the Canada Pension Plan Act and the Pension Act, and there are a number of these that are cited in Mr. Shepard's article. Um, uh, I, I always find this amusing when I read something like this, and I've been trying to deal with the government annuities branch, where the only asset of someone who is no longer mentally capable is a check, monthly check of $167, which the annuities branch will not pay over to the widow without an appointment of a comitetia. You know, and when, when you see sort of conflicting provisions here, giving min the minister great discretion in other acts. Well, the third topic that I uh, want to touch on are special types of letters of administration. Now, these, this is the portion of the paper which I will attach the precedence to uh, when the paper is published. And I only raise these because I have found over the years of practice that you can run into these difficult situations. Um, letters of administration with will annexed. Section 53 of the, of the Surrogate Courts Act governs the appointment of an administrator. And um, you're all aware of the types of situations where you may, the executor may not be able to act or is dead or whatever. And so you might want to have letters of administration with will and next issue. Um, one of the places where this difficulty comes about is where there is a foreign executor. And foreign um, banks, you know, banks in the United States and in England can act as as uh, executors. Uh, f uh, we cannot issue ancillary grants to foreign uh, banks or foreign trust companies, and therefore an ancillary grant um, cannot be uh, made by the Ontario court, and you must have someone appointed uh, in Ontario for letters of administration with will annexed. And a bond must be filed. The court likes to try you to try and get an affidavit of execution and use the exemplification from the foreign court. Um, I refer to a number of cases there, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip those. A second one is letters of administration de bonus known administratus with will annexed. And we don't often see this, but there, there, there was a solicitor, um, may he rest in peace, who always had himself named the sole executor of wills. Never an alternate, always the sole. And unfortunately, he passed away and left a number of estates unadminister, not the, with the administration not completed. And so everybody's left with the problem of having to get letters of administration to bonus known administratus with will annexed. And the difficulty, of course, the beneficiaries, under the, the surrogate court rules, the beneficiaries can make the application and so forth, but it becomes an, an added expense, especially when he didn't keep any proper executor's accounts, and you have to try and reconstruct those accounts. So let that be a lesson. Don't draft yourselves <laughs> into wills as the sole executor. Um, the third area is letters of administration pendente lite or lite. These are issued when uh, pending the validity, uh, question of the validity of a will. And again, in the paper, I point out the case law with respect to these and the way the courts have evolved. I want to simply draw your attention to the recent court case of Reed Lloyd. It's a 1979 24 Ontario report case, since it's one of the few up-to-date reported cases in this area. The widow made an application for an order appointing an administrator uh, pendente lighty for her husband's estate. And it the assets consisted mainly of shares in a private companies. There were two conflicting wills, caveats filed, everybody fighting, um, and the son who was looking after the private companies was an executor named in one of the will. The, the, the court um, in held that it should not exercise its discretion to appoint such an administrator unless the grant is necessary <clears throat> excuse me, to preserve the property of the estate. So that seems to be the the key, and that's the recent um, case. I, I've set out a procedure uh, for you in the paper as to how you should go about getting 
the appointment um, because it involves a number of steps and a number of, of documents. And the last topic, and I, I see by my handy calculator time clock that I'm rapidly going over the time, so I'll quickly mention the interests of infants in estates because here we have very little written in any of the textbooks. And this is just practical um, bread and butter information. Um, one of the difficulties, of course, is how to deal with the assets of infants. Um, where the assets, where the infant is a beneficiary under an estate and there is no will, or the will provides no power. Um, there is procedure under the Trustee Act, of course, to pay the proceeds into court. And in my view, that's the careful thing for any trustee to do. Um, one of the problems comes about, though, where the infant is residing in Ontario and the assets are out of Ontario. There is a conflict of laws problem between the province of Quebec and the province of Ontario regarding an infant's interest. In the province of Quebec, the parent or guardian can sign off a release and so forth on behalf of the infant. And they have a, they have a, a, a system called uh, tutors in Quebec. But it is my understanding that the executor in Quebec can simply hand the money over to a, the notary who administers the estate to be held for the infant. And um, in my view, um, th the money should be paid into court in the province of Ontario where the infant resides. Um, the law of the, uh, in my view, the law of the domicile of the infant should, should govern since the parent in Ontario has no authority to give uh, a receipt for the money coming in from Quebec. So you can, you can solve that situation by making an application um, to the court to have the money paid into court and the official guardian is very cooperative in, in obtaining court fiats uh, which are acceptable to the notaries in Quebec allowing the money then to come into Ontario and be paid into court. And in that, in that way, the assets are protected. Um, a, another problem uh, comes about where the infant resides out of Ontario and the assets are in Ontario. And the famous case that I've had to deal with was the case involving insurance proceeds, um, where the, the deceased was resident in Ontario, uh, was murdered by his common law spouse, who was the named beneficiary of the insurance proceeds. So by law, by operation of law, she disen disentitled herself to the insurance proceeds. She was indicted and so forth. Um, the beneficiaries then became his infant children who resided in Malaysia with their mother. And strangely enough, the applicant for letters of administration was the deceased mother in Newfoundland. But the assets were in Ontario. The insurance policies were taken out in Ontario, payable in Ontario. And so we had a reseal of letters of administration from Newfoundland, and then we, then we applied um, under the Trustee Act to have the monies paid into court to the credit of the infant children in, on, um, in Malaysia, but being held by the court in Ontario, because that was the only way the insurance companies could validly release the monies. One of the things that people seem to forget is that even though someone is appointed a guardian, of an infant under the Infants Act, that guardian has no inherent right to take the insurance monies that belong to a child. The, what the guardian has is the right to administer the income, take the income, or administer the income, or administer other assets which the, the, the child might own in his own right. So that if the insurance policy does not name a trustee for the infant, then, in my view, the insurance company has no other choice but to pay the money into court. Now, there are some solicitors who would disagree with me, but there's another case, another Lloyd case I refer you to, and this one is a 1949 case that I think um, makes it very difficult for the insurance company not to pay the money into court. And um, so those are some of the practical problems, um, and I have now gone at least five minutes over. Have a short coffee. Thank you.